Hey, what's up, man? Hello, Doc. How are you doing, Ahmed? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing all right, dude. Are you in Chicago today or in California? No, California. This month in uh, California. Oh, oh, so you kind of, you, you do it month by month? It depends. I go to California, to Chicago when they need me, when there's enough surgery lined up. Yeah. And I go do it. Then I come back here. Like uh, uh -huh. LA is kind of where I want to be the most. It's just yeah, Chicago's, yeah, Chicago's where I started. And I have a lot of following, a lot of patient base. So, yeah. So normally I go there, just do the implants, then come back. Do you still manage that clinic? It, yes, but it's kind of like self-run right now. Like I'm, uh, I'm more of like, I go to the monthly meetings and I get a check with the profit and there's a big operation running. Like I can disappear for six months and everything will keep running. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. Wow. Well, congratulations to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It took, it took a while, but it's kind of, this is why you see me always going to courses and, you know, yeah. traveling around because I have passive income from the office. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was just like kind of nice. I have three GPs working there. Mm -hmm. It's a six chair office. Mm -hmm. um, so they alternate. It's open six days a week. And there's like two hygienists and about 15 employees. I think yeah. instead of asking you about implant techniques, I want to ask you about, about business management. <laughs> <laughs> I'm GE, man. I'm GE training. <laughs> That's awesome, bro. Yeah, uh, thank yeah, you. I, I, I drew up some little sketches because, uh, so I'm, I'm actually, I'm recording this uh, just so okay. that way we can get some, um, so a little bit of instruction and insight into, into how you do things. Uh, okay. so I'm going to talk about that decompression technique. Uh, that's, it's, you got some really amazing results there. I saw your video. I saw the cases that you showed. Yeah. Uh, is it okay with you if I show a little, a couple sketches and ask you some questions? Cause I don't of know course. about this. Yeah, of course. No problem. Awesome. I'm just going to show my, show my screen here. Give me one second. One second, sorry. <clears throat> All right, so um, I want to try to understand this like I'm five years old. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, but really, because I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm curious about it. <clears throat> okay, so let me know if I'm right. So right now, say we place this implant and um, the bone level, you place it right at bone level. When you close it up, and you put a cover screw or something, there's pressure from the tissue at the crest, at like a, around the perimeter of the platform. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, most of the time, it doesn't really cause much of a problem though, right? Or am I wrong? Uh, so it depends. What we're trying to do right now is go past where I'm saying, oh, my implant has no bone loss to where, how much bone can I have above my implant? I love that. Okay. So if you're like looking for, okay, can it work? We've been doing it for years without it. Yes. But can you get such results where you literally go uncover an implant and you have two millimeter vertical above your implant that didn't exist and feel good about it, you know? So that's, that's how you get that nice papilla. That's when you go back and remove that bone and profile it nice and create a, you know, literally a buckle wall above the neck of the implant that supports your free gingival margin. So it's I more see. like going extra. So whereas before you'd look at the implant and say, wow, I got no bone loss. It's great. Uh, yeah. So now what you're thinking of, wow, I got a little bit of bone gain. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so what, um, if I understand it correctly, even if you add bone, uh, on top of the implant, there's still downwards pressure from the tissue. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, and what we're trying to do is place a healing abutment mm -hmm. to change the pressure from these red arrows to these blue arrows. Yes, exactly. Okay. So it's, it's as simple as that putting a, putting a healing abutment on, Yes, and basically you put the membrane over the healing abutment as well. 
Okay, membrane over the healing abutment. Now, do you still, do you release the tissue just like you were doing the GBR? It depends on how the tissue is in the situation. Yes, you might have to, you might not. And again, so two points you want to pay attention to, to, to doing that is you don't want to put a healing abutment more than two millimeter. Okay. And you don't want to do that when the tissue itself is thinner than two millimeter. When the tissue is thinner than two millimeters. Okay. Yes. So when you raise your flap, you want to pay attention to the shear thickness because at the end of the day, you're going to think about blood flow into the tissue. And if that tissue is trying to climb up and heal and close your incision line over that space, the metal healing abutment, and it's not thick enough, now you're going to end up with wound opening and the tissue is going to dehesce around the healing abutment. Mm -hmm. Now you don't end up, the idea is still to maintain primary closure, even when you're doing this. Interesting. So you don't do this for, so would you just say for like a thin biotype, you don't use this technique? No, I wouldn't use that. Got it. So for thick biotype, this is a great way to get more bone above your platform. Yes. And ultimately more tissue, because what you're thinking about is we all know, and that's what this idea got a little bit of resistance before it got published, was you're placing a healing abutment and you're telling me I'm going to grow bone around it. So your brain tells you right away, that's not going to happen because me and you are trained and know we need threads, we need aggressive, uh, I mean, we need rough surface for bone to grow. So keep in mind, I'm not trying to grow bone attached to the healing abutment. It's not going to happen. What I'm trying to do, imagine when you place an implant in a very wide ridge and you end up with that creative like look when you look at it from the top and mm -hmm. now you have bone growing up on each side. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. And so, but what's going to happen around the healing abutment now there's tissue invasion that's going to go down around the healing abutment and surround your healing abutment. Mm -hmm. And that in return, when you remove the healing abutment and you place a, the, the final or the custom abutment or the final abutment, then hopefully your implant has a platform switch. Now you have more tissue growing and you increase the tissue height at the same time from two millimeter to four millimeter. Right, so, okay. Yeah, so you're doing increasing bone above the neck and you're doing tissue grafting at the same time. Do you, act, do you actually have to do tissue grafting or, or not? Well, I'm a strong believer in Thomas and I believe in uh, his research of vertical tissue augmentation mm -hmm. uh, before he basically did a systemic review and he realized like if we go past the 3.6 millimeter of vertical tissue thickness, you get mo way better crystal bone stability. Gotcha. So to me, always the depth of my implant has to be at least 3.6, which is we normally round up to four millimeter, uh, uh, apical to the free gingival margin of the crown that's sitting on top of that implant. Gotcha. I, I guess what I, what I meant to ask was, are you doing additional tissue grafting at the time uh, that, that you use the compression technique? Uh, no, because the idea is that's decompression technique itself. That's going to actually be your tissue grafting. It's going to increase tissue thickness. Uh, so when would I do that? Uh, so when would I do tissue grafting with a decompression technique? Honestly, I wouldn't because I would want to put a connective tissue graft over there to increase tissue thickness when I don't start with the two. Gotcha. So this is kind of like a perfect idea when you have two millimeter of vertical tissue height mm -hmm. and you want to make it four. Okay. How can I make it four? I can put a healing abutment, put bone around it, close the, the membrane over the healing abutment, release the flap if I have to, and get primary closure over. Now when I uncover, I can make my incision again, remove my two millimeter healing abutment and place a five millimeter healing abutment. Mm -hmm. It's going to be super gingival. <clears throat> I see. Um, so I, I know that the the most common, I guess, application for this, or at least the most questions that I'm going to get about this is not necessarily about how to build bone above my implant, but actually in this scenario right here, where mm -hmm. you have exposed threads on the buckle. Yes. Uh, so that happens so often and people are like, oh, can I just slap some bone on there? Is that going to work? Um, so, okay, let me ask you, can we just slap some bone on this exposed buckle thread? Will, will this work with the, if you follow the decompression Principles? Okay, so uh, if without decompression, we have been doing it, right? Where we put the bone in there and we cover the membrane. 
And if you want my honest opinion, that's something that you have to have a little bit deeper understanding. When can I build bone, regardless of the implant or no? So mm -hmm. what I would say is the implant ridge. You're showing me, for example, one coronal cut of the implant at the midline. I want to see where is that implant positioned in the three dimension of the buccal lingual or, or the two dimension of the buccal lingual walls. If mm -hmm. I have so much bone to uh, distal and mesial to the implant that would house my bone grafting, then yes, I would do that, mm -hmm. right? Because we have to think about if I want to grow bone there, it needs blood supply. If I already have a really wide implant in a thin ridge, that's not going to happen. It doesn't matter what technique I'm using. Mm -hmm. So decompression is not going to save you. You still have to look at where you're placing your implant, where's that blood supply coming, the tissue thickness coming over. Now, in a scenario, for example, you're trying to place a five millimeter ridge where you have exposed threads, but the ridge posterior and anterior to the implant side is 10 millimeter, then yes, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. But if the ridge behind it and in front of it is five millimeter and you're trying to build outside the jaw frame, no, it's not going to work, right? So I you want to do a big GPR, then place your implant. Now, mm -hmm. the one re recommendation where I would follow is it doesn't matter what I'm grafting with. I always cover the threads with autogenous bone. So in this case, I would do some bone scraping. I would cover the threads with autogenous. Then I'll put allograft over. Then I'll put xenograft over. Do you then have? Would, do you, would you say? Would you strongly recommend that everybody who does this uses xenograft uh, to cover it? As a, not as a veneering. So xenograft. So again, when we're looking at the jaw shape, imagine from then an axial cut. If where I'm placing the bone material is within the frame of the jaw, then I'm using allograft in that space. Okay. If I'm placing it outside the frame, then I'm using xenograft. Okay, understood. Yeah, so this is actually not just one big blob of bone. This is uh, autologous bone chips for over there, an allograft, yeah. and then some and type then, of xenograft, and then xenograft after. Then the healing abutment, then the membrane goes all the way over the healing abutment, even tucked into the lingual. Okay. And then you cover the tissue over. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And remember the first most important thing is the width of the ridge, because you're going to think blood supply to the bone graft that you're doing. Right. Okay. So this would work great when you have one edentula space where you have a little dip. Yes. Uh, so it's fat, skinny, and then fat, right? Yes. Okay. I would love to show your cases here because it looks like you got some great results. Yeah. So you're, I think you're, this is where you're just uncovering. Yes. So this is the case before I started really taking photos and I just, uh, this was actually an immediate case uh -huh. and you can tell under the buckle, how all that bone was built up. That buckle plate was completely gone. Mm -hmm. And I even placed it a little bit deeper thinking, oh, let me just be safe and go deeper mm -hmm. uh, because I wasn't so confident about how much bone we're going to build up. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's an image before. Uh, Sorry, you want me to go yeah, to the... It's okay. Yeah, you can play this video first, then okay. we can talk. So in these cases, it's not like you're necessarily placing subcrestal. You don't have that big wall of bone because you're placing subcrestal. You have it because you use decompression. Yes. But are you placing subcrestal as well? Um, it depends on the kind of implant that I'm using. So if it's a hex, uh, I'm aiming for bone level, even 0.5 supra. If it's conical, then it's subcrestal. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, you can yeah. You definitely appreciate that, that wall of bone circumferentially. Yeah, like you can imagine if a tooth was there, there's no way the bone would even be at that level. If you really look at it, how mm -hmm. wide the bone is, that space of the bone was completely occupied by the root structure. I see. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> you have one more space here yeah. that you shared. Let me bring that one up. Oops, starting off the wrong one. <clears throat> okay, so in this case, so this is what the ridge looked like when you placed it. Did you place an implant here too or no? Yes, and this is actually a really nice slide what I wanna talk about this case here, which is a little bit away from decompression technique. Uh, but the reason why I took this picture and I completely remember 
Uh, there are certain times where when we have a very thin ridge, I actually prep the osteotomy uh, to the same size of the implant. Okay. So, you know, and I've seen you talk about it on Instagram, where is primary stability needed for implants? Mm -hmm. And you know, the answer is no, as far as it doesn't wobble right, left. If it's a spinner, you can close it up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what ended up happening to me a few times in those cases, when I'm trying to place a 3.3 implant and I reach a 3.0 and I reach my Versa and I'm like, okay, perfect. There's no perf, implant doesn't show. Then I go place my implant and now the implant is a little bit wider and it ends up breaking the bone. Right. So I said, let's just place a spinner on purpose and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I've done it a handful of times and it works beautiful where I even sometimes prep the 3.5 osteotomy with Versa, knowing that it's going to rebound, place the 3.3 in and let the bone rebound back. And I don't end up with any exposed threats. I see. I see. Okay. So what you're doing is you're over prepping in width a little bit. Yes. So that way you don't crack the ridge or have anything uncontrolled. Yes. From the insertion tour. And so now I, so yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Primary stability is not a hundred percent. So you don't need to get a certain number, a certain torque measurement. Yes. But that's you need your implant to not move. So yes. how do you get it to not move? So again, I'm prepping with Versa. Mm -hmm. I know my starting ridge is already very, very thin, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm placing, for example, 3.3. I'm finishing the osteotomy between 3.3, 3.5. Mm -hmm. And then I place my implant. And of course, with the Versa, you're going to get the rebound effect, mm -hmm. which is usually measures to 0.4. And you just place the implant in there and watch it and just try to rotate it. Now the implant is not going to rotate. Oh, that's nice. So you torque it to maybe hand torque to 10, but mm -hmm. now all your buckle bone stayed. Because mm -hmm. like the that. moment I was trying to force it in, the apex is always going to poke through. Now I'm trying to scrape bone, cover it. So that's I was like, let me try that. And I learned this where from the Versa course, where he literally had us prep an osteotomy bigger than the bone, put the implant in and he's like, wait five minutes, then he would carry the implant with the bone in it because the bone rebounded big time uh -huh. so it's kind of using that. that to your advantage and of course doing this you already plan that you are not going to place a healing abutment you are going to put bone over the cover screw and bury this implant because you could end up with not much stability just a spinner but if you cover it with bone you placed it subcrestal you should be fine mm -hmm. to do that. And that's what I ended up doing in this case. And I did that yeah. in one osteotomy while the other, I didn't do that. And with everything that I did still perfed a little bit <laughs> under. And this was an uh -huh. osteotomy. That's literally the same size as the implant. Uh -huh. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, just because the small discrepancy of the taper and, and uh, the implant. The and the implant the drills. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I, I do want to ask you, sorry, um, kind of going off topic a little bit. Yeah. I love how you maintain the bone and you grow bone. Um, does that become a problem for you when you try to take impressions? Uh, because a lot of people, this is not, this is not a beginner technique, right? But um, yeah. there is some, some technique sensitivity to having to go back in there and, and drill bone away. You know what yes. I mean? So are you having to drill bone away every time? Uh, almost always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like my uncovery visits. It's usually about an hour and a half. Okay. Uh, because I'm spending a good 45 minutes with the piezo profiling every angle around the implant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so if you work at like corporate, corporate dentistry, trying to get things done, this is not the technique to use. This is, no, no. Get, this is trying to, if you're trying to get next level results. Yes. If you really like, anterior area you want to make sure that the free gingival margin is really really nice you want to gain even more than what you had so uh back in the day like i used to think that's it just connective tissue graft now i'm like let me help myself as much as possible before i go back to connective tissue graft because if i can build the bone higher then i even need less tissue yeah i see that makes sense I'm, I'm looking up your instagram real quick i want to make sure to be able to uh, send people your way it's Dr. Matari, right? Yes. Is it um, 
dr dot mataria dr underscore mataria underscore dds Awesome. Okay, great. Uh, I want to make sure we look at the rest of this, the rest of this case. So then you just use like conventional GBR technique after that. Yeah. So here I showed this picture where I covered the threads with autogenous. Then this is the allograft, and notice mm -hmm. how it's within the frame of the jaw. I didn't build up with it. And notice mm -hmm. how the one on the left where I did not over prep, I placed the healing abutment. Where the other one where I overpred my osteotomy, I did not place a healing abutment and I covered it with bone. Okay. So the one where you did overprep, you put a cover screw because you didn't want anything to touch it and move it all. Yes. Off. Yeah. Awesome. And you did use bone chips. And on top of that, allograft. Yeah. And you notice here there is beside the allograft, now there's the bio os that's going over the allograft. I think there's another picture of just showing the BIOS without the membrane. Let's see. Yeah, I think that was one of the first pictures right here. Uh, no. One more, no, keep going. Or no, that's it. Maybe not. No. Okay, so you kind of can tell that there's two kind of graft over from the next picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see how the bigger bigger parts, particles, which is the bio os over the allograft. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's because again, we're, we're grafting outside the frame where naturally bone wouldn't grow. So whenever you're, you're grafting outside the frame, xenograft. Yes. Gotcha. And that's from Dr. Miron's and Dr. Pico's actually together. That's what I learned that. Uh, what kind of membrane are you using here? Uh, this is a six plus. Mm -hmm. And this is just the trying paper from the cover. I'm sure you're familiar with that. So you don't waste back mm -hmm. and forth. Yeah. So you just use that as a little template for your, for your, um, your membrane. Yes, for shaping the membrane here around the nasal spine. And we use the uh, three subperiosteal suturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you notice as much as you can try to do is put those, make sure the sutures don't cross freely over the implant. So you see the one on the right, how far lateral that suture goes. Yeah. Uh, the one on the left, I didn't care so much again, because it's subcrestal and I have the healing abutment that's going to prevent much pressure. But the idea is to keep the bulk of the graft that you place there over the implant and not have it pushed to the one of the sides. So you can maintain the most buckle. Bone. So do you stabilize your membrane always using the suture technique or do you use tacks or do you do you, I know some people don't use anything, right? Yeah. So, so uh, first, uh, so logically, you want to think about it again, it goes to the morphology of the defect. So if I look at it, and if it looks like sometimes when you look at a defect, the buckle, and if you literally like look out, it looks like just a socket, right? So mm -hmm. you can just put some bone in there and put a membrane in and close the flap and nothing is going to move. Versus when you don't have walls to the right or the left or your defect where you have to stabilize it. Mm -hmm. uh, so my favorite is of course to do nothing, just tunnel, uh, sneak in some bone graft, uh, tunnel the membrane and just don't even stabilize it. Uh, the bigger the flap, the more I'm going for and the morphology of the defect where it doesn't self-contain it, the more I'm going for tax. Uh, now, of course you have to pay attention to your membrane, some membranes don't like to be tacked, like S6 Plus is not really good to be tacked. So if I'm tacking, I'm actually using a Memlock or BioGuide. Uh, Subperiosteal suturing is the opposite. Memlock keeps flexing back where S6 Plus is perfect to be sutured. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna look at the depth of your vestibule because if you have enough to do a good release where you leave a good periosteum to suture into, uh, so honestly, it's hard to decide what I'm doing till I get there and I look at the defect, place the bone and be like, okay, how can I stabilize it? How can I get the membrane? What do I need to do to move, to stop it from moving? I see. So there's no, there's no blanket general, general way to do it. You keep all these things on hand to yeah. match the situation. Yeah. I always, I'm sure you've seen the post. I try to think of the basics like blood supply. Do I have blood supply to where I'm placing this bone? You know, do I need to decorticate? Do I need to scrape? Then think of stabilization. Okay, I put my bone there. So how can I stop it from moving? 
and just keep thinking it's step after step. Then, okay, I want to isolate tissue. Did I perf the periosteum? Do I need to put a membrane or no? Uh, because I've done very, very cases where it was just hardly no ridge. And I said, you know, let me just try it. Just minimum incision. Did not even separate the bone all the way down. Just put some simple membrane and, co- and bone graft and closed it up. And I was like, let me see what happened. Mm-hmm. And you would be surprised how much bone you can get in three to four months. And then we, then my, that's one thing I always say is when you start trying to build, don't go trying to build like crazy. Uh, you're still going to get another chance to place that implant. So if I'm doing bone grafting and I know I'm staging it, I'm not trying to get that 20 millimeter right away or, you know, 10 millimeter maybe right away. I'm trying to say, okay, let's keep this procedure simple. Let me see if I can do it flapless, put some bone in there. Then when I go place the implant, now I can add a little bit more if I need to. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I found out, the less I try to do, the less I try to flap and release verticals, the better the results is coming out with me. I see. I've heard of the uh, barrier by bulk um, approach as well. Does that, so you would actually rather not bulk it up more than you feel you need to because you, you get more yeah. results yes because again and that's also zucchelli's telling you it's like does it even look pretty it doesn't at one point you see those results where you're looking and there's like so much bone over there it looks like a tumor on the side of the jaw mm-hmm. like to me when i see that when we see that in real teeth what do we do we go remove it so why are we trying to build it where it doesn't belong uh-huh. right and not just that, we understand right now, you don't need big implants. Like I don't even carry f- more than a five millimeter implant. So why would I ever want to build more than a 10 millimeter ridge? That's interesting. Why don't you keep a f- more than a five millimeter implant? So I, I, I'm, I'm of the same um, philosophy, yeah. but why? Uh, so to me is like more bone, less metal. Implants fail left and right. And uh, my philosophy is use the shortest, smallest implant that will do the job. So again, think backward, how much occlusion do I need for this implant to handle? And I'm going to use the size that can handle that occlusion and not more. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the same idea, if I give you a frame and tell you put it in the wall, are you going to put a really big nail for a small frame? Mm-hmm. Doesn't make sense. You're going to put the nail that matches the frame. Mm-hmm. So once I start thinking like that, life got easier and um, precision got better. Uh, failures are easier to handle and implants work such as good. In Europe right now, they're even placing molars at a 3.5 implants. Mm-hmm. And one thing I, which is I'm not 100% sure, but it gets you thinking is, for example, if you look at the BLX, their five millimeter and their 3.5 have the same platform size. So how much is a five stronger if they both have the same implant connection? That's right. Yeah. I feel like you can pretty much get away with almost doing every implant with a 3.7 by 10. Yeah. That, just from an exactly. internal standpoint, it's like every implant's the same. Okay. You know, yeah. You think. Exactly. Like you don't need all those sizes. We make it complicated more than we need to. It's just understand the body and you know, it works like I don't even because I travel around and I place so many different systems like you. I don't even look at the manufacturer's drilling protocol. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You just know. like you just know what you need to do. You just look at the drills. Look at the implant. Boom. <laughs> so okay, I, I, this is this is the most interesting picture for me. Can you tell me what's going on here? So this is the case that we saw together. And those are actually uh, six months results. So you can see all the bone that we had Mm -hmm. built out on top of number seven and on top of number 10. Mm -hmm. And you see how seven was the one that actually poked through there. Mm -hmm. And uh, 10 is the one with the healing abutment. And you see all the bone that formed above the neck of the implant that was never even there to begin with. Yeah. That's pretty amazing, man. I, I love that. Let's see. Did you... Is there one more picture to it? Okay, this is... Yeah, so this is the uncovery. Mm -hmm. And you can see again how I profiled the bone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can appreciate it. Like this is the one where you see the bone actually coming up. And I actually did not even reflect all the buckle because to me it's grafted bone. You don't want to reflect it at all and expose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you see it in the CT. And you see the height that we were able to gain. Um, 
And you had to go back in plant. and, and uh, profile it with the piezo. Yeah. And if you remember, there was like nothing there, nothing there at all on the buckle. Yeah, so that, all that's built up and then you go back and I guess, how much do you profile? Um, so you're gonna think of the implant size versus abutment. So in this case, I was using a 3.3 and my platform for the connection is four. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna profile um, just enough to where you try. I have the try-in abutments that I actually use while I'm doing this profiling and I make sure they fit nicely okay. before I finish. I yeah, see. this is a better picture. Yeah, you can see all the bone on the buckle that we were able to build. Yeah, definitely. Are there scenarios where it doesn't work out like this, where you're like, oh man, this one didn't work? Um, honestly, I, it hasn't disappointed me yet. You know, okay. again, it's, it's the scenarios where it failed. Uh, I had one case where, yes, I got so much tissue around and I did not really get that good of a bone around, right? But I still ended up with bone at the implant level. So it's more, again, like shoot for the sky. So if you fall, you fall in the clouds. Like you're trying to build above. So even when it doesn't happen, you're like, oh, I just got it one level. It's not a big deal. So those are kind of like the connect that I place. Are and you those? Are those? So those are like multi-unit abutments, mm -hmm. but for single T. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the main advantage of them, they actually make the tissue from now on, from the day of uncovery till restoration. Now we're taking impression super bony. We never have to go touch that bone again. Mm -hmm. And it actually has an internal hex connection, which makes it easier to restore. But the part that connects to the implant, of course, it's a conical connection. And that's a very, very, very important piece for your company to make for us, please. <laughs> This this is a little multi in it, right? Oh man, it's a it's a it's a what what they call the transmucosal abutment. Mm -hmm. uh, Nobel had one, but the main difference that this company did, which is really really smart, is they made it an internal hex. Mm -hmm. So you still torque into it to thirty, not like a multi unit where you can torque to fifteen. Right. You still have a hex connection and I place it a lot of times at the time of the surgery, so you never have to see the bone again. Interesting. I love that. Yeah, I, I see that you you use this a lot on the cases that you share. Yeah. On Instagram. Here we go. And what are these guys? So what I do the day of uncovery with the connect is to already rather than me having to wait and train the tissue the same day or trying to make my own temp because right now I'm a little bit spoiled and I have my own lab uh, where I just put the scan body, I suture and the lab would make the temp and the patient would come the next day and we would deliver it to them. I see. So you, you're actually, you're able to make the temp without having the tissue. Well, the, it's just a temp, yes. right? Or is it a final? Yeah. No, no, it's just a temp. Yes. And this is way where I form the tissue according to the temp. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And sometimes I do that at the day of the surgery if I got a really nice torque where mm -hmm. after I place, I scan it, then I get primary closure. Now I can make a custom healing abutment. When I go uncover, it's already ready mm -hmm. and I don't have to do it by hand. So it's, it's really making dentistry more fun to work with the lab, you know? Bro, I think, I feel like you oh, need to teach your own course. <laughs> you have so much, you have so much knowledge to share, man. Thank you. Are, are you teaching any courses or no? Uh, I actually teach hands-on implant placement in Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, for an organization called Train On. I'm one of That's many right. instructors they have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the course is pretty intense. We go in for uh, five days and you place 30 implants live in five days. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. it's, it's all where we spend one-on-one -on -one time and I teach you as much as I know in those five days. Uh, is, that doc is that for doctors who are just starting out or is that for people who are advanced already? Uh, honestly, everyone, depending on how you feel, because uh, again, it depends on the instructor. Like I had prosthodontists from overseas come take the course because they didn't really learn it in school, how to place implants. I had doctors that have like little experience. Uh, I don't recommend it if you haven't taken some simple courses. Like if I ask you what's a hex from conical and you don't know, then no, you shouldn't come take the course. Okay, you yeah. should really have a good knowledge. Maybe take your course first, know exactly what all the parts are, what all the basics are, how much bone, how much distance. Then you can get more of the course. 
Uh, sadly, there's people that come and they don't know anything about anything and we walk them through everything. Right, uh, it's kind of a waste of time, waste of money. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you want to come where at least we say at least if you read or placed maybe five, 10 implants and you're still hesitant and you're like, I'm not 100% sure what I'm doing still yet. I need someone to like set things straight. And that's where we come in and we'd be like, okay, you're going to do it 30 times in five days, following the same protocols, following the same technique, looking at everything in all different scenarios. And we do from full arch to in sinus to split ridge to immediates to delayed everything. It sounds like a lot so, of fun, man. I'm going to have to go one yeah. of these days. I just can't afford the course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think you need it, man. No. <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, guys, this is Dr. Mataria. I'm going to make sure to link all of, all of his information here so you can follow him. Uh, you're very generous in, in sharing these cases with me. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for the mess. Actually, I did not think we we're going to be doing videos that much. But... <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause the recording right now, but I just want to chat for a second. Sounds good. Let's see, how do I stop it? I can't stop it because it's not my meeting. Okay, that's okay. Because Sonia set it up. <laughs> right, it'll stop when I finish the, the, when we end the Zoom call. Okay. Um, but yeah, man, I, I, I appreciate it, dude. Uh, thanks so much for, for sharing a tip with us. And I know you, you have a ton of tips to share. Um, yeah, anyway, we, we can help you more. Uh, honestly, no, man. Honestly, like I, I appreciate what you're doing. I see what you're doing. That's why, you know, uh, I said I'm happy to help whenever you need me and anything I can do more. It's, it's, okay. You know, it's, this is passion for me. I love teaching. I love sharing okay. things. And uh, it's, it's nice to have a different outlet and be exposed to other people. Uh, I can see in the future where, again, and again, it's not that I believe me, man, like I'm already getting crazy people trying to send to my lab, but I only started this zero bone loss lab because I was tired of people, of labs not giving me good quality. That's right. You're starting the zero bone loss lab. Yeah. 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 So right now it's, I've been dealing with the machine getting fixed. Mm -hmm. On the phone, we got the PM7 from Ivoclar. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot of a lot of figuring it out how to work. So it's been driving me crazy trying to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, know, I, know that, I know that you're flying around a lot and, and really busy, but maybe one of these days we could find a way to to bring you as a as a guest, uh, a, a guest instructor here once we start our hands-on courses. One day maybe. <laughs> can convince you sounds good sounds good yeah i i actually i love i love doing hands-on more than webinars or lectures it's yeah it's so more nice when you're interacting with the doctor hands-on for sure man all right dude okay well, doc go. thank you so much thanks so much yeah. all right see you man